Oh. Good evening. Uh, welcome to the seventh uh, session uh, of DICE, um, Expanding the Frontiers of Economics webinar series. Uh, and today we are very excited to have Rosa Abraham. Uh, she's going to talk about does marriage and motherhood impact women's participation in labor market? And this is a wonderful paper that she has written uh, with uh, Rahul Lahoti and Hema Swaminathan. And uh, Rosa is an assistant professor at the Center for Sustainable Employment at the Azim Premji University. Her doctoral research focused on the forms of informal labor in India, examining the rise of informalization in the formal and organized sector and consequent impact on the productivity and inequality. And she's a nominated member of Kerala State Planning uh, Board uh, Working Group on Women and Employment. And we are really lucky to have her. Rosa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Satvik, and thank you, Anisha, too, for the opportunity to present and talk about my work. And as Satvik said, this is a group teamwork. I mean, this is in collaboration with uh, Rahul Lahoti, who's here, and uh, with Hema Swaminathan, who couldn't attend today. Um, I'm just going to share my screen so we can get started. Okay. Um, right. Uh, okay, so the context in which this um, study has emerged is basically to look at the question of the declining labor force participation in India. And I think most of the participants, I mean, most, most of the folks attending here today would be fairly familiar with the conundrum of de declining female labor force participation in India. It's already been, it's always been at very low levels, but also in more recent years, it's been steadily declining. Urban employment, female employment has more or less stagnated at 20%, whereas for uh, rural, it's just been a steady decline from around 50% in uh, 2004, five to uh, nearly half of that in uh, more recent years. So there are a number of reasons put forward for why this has been uh, happening. Um, so one of this is the income effect, which argues that as income levels rise and as men earn more um, and household incomes are increasing, women then are the first to sort of withdraw from the labor force. Um, and there is also evidence to suggest that if you look at the movement of women from the labor force, from 2004 5 onwards, most of this has happened amongst households which are extremely poor. And these are the households which may have seen a steady increase in their income. Um, so there are several um, discussions around that. Then there is the uh, notion that the gender no norms, uh, certain um, you know, uh, restrictions on women participating in paid work can also then further. Um, uh, deny them access to the labor market. There is also the understanding that women feel the need to adhere to certain stereotypes. Um, husbands feel the need that women should prescribe to certain no uh, rules. There's also the immediate social infrastructure that keeps women out of the labor market. Then there's of course the demand side issues, which says that there's not been enough good jobs being created as women being uh, pushed out of agriculture manufacturing and services have failed to generate sort of good jobs for women. And then there's also a literature which tackles this question uh, from the point of measurement that women are indeed actually working and in, in fact employed, but labor market surveys as they stand now are not well equipped to capture the kinds of work that women do. Most of this work could are either marginal or it is sort of informal and standard questions as they are asked may uh, overlook some of these kinds of work. It could also matter who the question of labor uh, of employment is asked to that uh, men may typically under report women's work. So these are several ways in which the question of uh, women's declining participation has been looked at. And another strand of literature is basically looking at life cycle dynamics, which is looking at the role of major events and how these events over the course of a woman's life can also play a role in her entry and exit from the labor market. So in the context of this paper, what we were particularly interested in was to look at 
the major life events of marriage and childbirth, and to see how these affected uh, women's participation in the labor market. So <clears throat> in the context of both of these events, there are certain prescriptive roles that are assigned to women as mothers and as wives. And these roles then place heavy constraints on women's time as well as their mobility, which then hampers their participation in the labor market. In the developing countries, in the developed countries, sorry, norms around ma marriage have loosened. So there's been steady increase in entry of women, uh, especially post the world wars, where when men were not participating, uh, women were forced to sort of engage, and that led to a loosening of no norms around marriage. Um, and then developed countries, we don't really see much norms around marriage as such, but there are certain, there is still the um, important role that childbirth and motherhood still plays in women's uh, participation and earnings, even in a developed country context, where the, the notion of penalty is applied to explain this, where they say that there's a reduction either in the participation of women or in the earnings that they have post childbirth. And there is empirical evidence to sort of, um, to sort of uh, qualify, to, to, to assert this point. Um, so in that developed country context is a, a paper by Clevin et al, who's done a study of several developed countries. In this graph, I've just shown the results for Denmark, Sweden, Austria, and Germany, uh, where the first two lines on top is basically the change in earnings. So here we are looking at a fall in earnings. So fall in earnings of men after childbirth, which is the first two lines. Um, this is in Denmark and this is in Sweden. And then these two are for women. And so clearly there's almost a 50%, more than a 60, or almost a 60% decline of uh, earnings of women in uh, Sweden, a 30% of decline in, of earnings of women in Denmark, for instance, which is what they then, what is understood as the childbirth penalty, which is the drop in earnings, which never really recovers. They never go back to their pre-childbirth levels. And so this is how the notion of child penalty has been conceptualized in developing, developed countries. Um, so a study by Aguera et al, which looks at actually 21 developing countries, explores this, context, context, uh, this concept of a child penalty uh, alongside uh, uh, across these 21 countries. And what they find is that, um, I don't know if you can see the x-axis. Um, basically, the x-axis is the GDP per capita um, for the country. So as you go, as you go um, to the right of the x-axis, as GDP per capita increases, the child penalty, which is the drop in earnings, um, really starts to decline. But it's interesting here to note that for some countries, especially the poorer countries, you have actually an increase in the child, uh, in the earnings, which is sort of a premium uh, post-childbirth. So, for example, in Mozambique and Nepal, there's actually an increase in earnings post childbirth, which then contests the commonly understood notion of a child penalty as it's understood in the developed country context. Now, um, this paper by Berniel now looks specifically at this question in the Chilean uh, context. And what they find is that in Chile, too, there is, this is the labor market participation uh, change and the orange line is for men and for women, this is the green line. What they find in the years since childhood, there's a huge drastic de decline in employment rates um, for women and no change uh, for men at all. Right? So, but then what, when they look at what is the kind of employment that is changing, what they're finding is that the change in employment is largely seen in the case of formal jobs. So formal jobs take a hit. So women in formal employment or formal employment rates take a hit. And informal employment, on the, on the other hand, initially declines. So in the first year after childbirth, there's about a 30%, 22% decline in um, women in informal job. But then this then picks up subsequently. So from around three years after childbirth, the um, share in informal job is not the probability of participating in an informal job is not very different from that pre-childbirth. So the finding here is that if there is a penalty in terms of withdrawal from the labor market, but this is largely seen in the formal uh, job market. Informal jobs are more or less um, unaffected. So that kind of adds a certain nuance that is not seen in the developed country con context to the notion of a child penalty. 
Um, <clears throat> now, in the context of India and on the question of childbirth and women's work, there's been limited evidence. There have been some very recent studies, uh, including by Gupta, Gautam, and Deshpande and Singh, which looks at the context of uh, childbirth and women's labor market participation. So Gupta uh, looks at, finds that uh, they use the instrument of having children between the age of zero to five years old and find that mother's participation reduces by about 10% where if there are young children present in the household and this participation reduction is largely seen amongst highly educated women as well as uh, women from uh, wealthier households. Um, Gautam in a very recent job market paper looks explores the notion of a wage penalty. So here she's not looking at participation penalty but rather wage penalty and finds that in urban areas post childbirth women take um, women with children take a hit in terms of their earnings, but they don't, you don't see a similar hit in the case of rural uh, women. So rural wage change is very, is, is insignificant in the case of women with uh, young children. Uh, in a recent paper, Ashwani Deshpande and Desh, Jitendra Singh uses, so the previous two papers actually use IHDS data, which is a panel, and so it has these two time points. Sorry, uh, Gupta uses IHDS, Gautam uses a pooled uh, national sample survey. It's a cross-sectional data, which is pooled together. Gupta uses a panel data. Now, CMI is the private data source for India, which actually has a fairly long panel from 2016 till around, till now. Uh, tracking same women over time. And Deshpande and Singh explore the question of uh, what happens to women post childbirth. And interestingly, they don't find any significant change in female labor force participation rate around childbirth. What they note is that there seems to be a, an increase, a, a fall in FL, uh, labor force participation the year prior to childbirth. So there's some kind of anticipatory effect happening. Um, most of the other studies really in India is constrained by the lack of access to panel data. And so there are these cross-sectional studies which compare between uh, women who have young children versus not young children, but then this has its own um, limitations. And in the context of the question of marriage, um, again, we are really constrained by the lack of uh, uh, panel data. And uh, here also, the, an, it has been largely cross-sectional analysis which looks at what is the employment rate um, for married women and compares this with the employment rate for non-married women. Now, this comparison in itself can't tell us the causal effect of marriage and how marriage in itself it is, uh, changes women's uh, uh, interaction with the labor market because you're essentially comparing two different groups of people. There has been some studies, again, uh, using the IHDS data, which is a panel data, uh, where they find that in between the two panels, if a mother, if the mother-in-law died, then that would reduce women's labor force participation, implying that there is some kind of um, uh, support that the presence of a mother-in-law offers, which allows women to participate in the paid labor market. Uh, they also find that living in a joint family, there's another paper by Dhanraj and Mahabre finding that, that find that living in a joint family can actually lower women's participation, possibly implying the role of norms and uh, certain um, you know, prescriptive roles aside for women in a larger family context. Um, so in this uh, context, our questions were basically to look at how do these major life events affect li women's labor market participation. And since keeping the Chile study in mind and what was the change in what, what really happens in a developing country context, we also wanted to explore the change in the nature of labor, for, labor force participation after these events and then question the idea or the notion of a work penalty in the Indian context. So coming to sort of the, the data that we've done, so this all of this is based on a, a two-state survey known as the India Working Survey which was conducted by the Center for Sustainable Employment um, as a collaborative pro project uh, between APU, IIM Bangalore, and the University of Western Australia. It's funded by IVAGE, as well as APU, and IMB and UNU wider. And the broad aim of this project was to look at how social identities, uh, including which include gender, caste, and religion, affect labor market outcomes. Um, so the study was conducted in the northern state of uh, Rajasthan and southern state of Karnataka. Uh, and basically what we did was we surveyed around 3,646 households 
In each household, we interviewed a randomly selected adult male and a randomly selected adult female. And so in total, our sample is about 6,000 individuals and equally, more or less equally spread across the two states. We have a slightly higher sample of women. Um, now, this survey was supposed to be representative at the state level, um, but what happened was we were, um, the pandemic happened and we had to sort of cut the survey short prematurely. So we were only able to complete about 60% of this. And since most of our initial survey was covering the rural sample and the urban sample was to be interviewed in the second half, um, our, the data that we have is a predominantly rural data. So I will say that the, the results are not representative of either of these states in that sense. Um, and it's a broadly rural uh, sample as well. So just two caveats to keep in mind when we look at these results. Right. Now, what did we do? So the, elite, the IWS survey had a larger mandate, but within the IWS survey, we used an instrument, we used a survey instrument called the Life History Calendar method to collect retrospective data. So what the LHC method does is that it basically uses major life events like childbirth, like um, exit from education, marriage, major shocks um, in the household, to help uh, men and women uh, aid to, to, to kind of recall their employment as well as their other activities around those events. So the information on labor market participation and other important life events were collected from our respondents from when they were 15 years old till their current age. So every respondent that we approached, we would ask them, okay, when were your, to, we would sort of start with when did you finish uh, schooling around the time that you finished school after you finished schooling what were the kinds of what is the work that you primarily engaged in we collected information on the different kinds of work that they did so was it casual wage work was it self employment was it uh, unpaid family work so were you working in the family enterprise and so on and now using this so for every year from when they were 15 years old till current year age we have information on what is the kind of work they did if they were working. And we also have the information for when uh, they were married and which year they had children, um, all of their children, we would have their event years, so to speak. And then we use the event study framework to estimate the impact of childbirth on women's labor market. So childbirth and marriage on women's labor force participation. So the event study framework is largely uh, motivated by the framework in uh, Clevens et al. So what it, this has is your Y variable is your outcome. For us, it's so the Clevens model, for instance, the outcome that they were looking at were, uh, was earnings. For us, it's employment. It could also be the kind of employment, so the participation in a particular kind of employment. And uh, this is recorded for individual I at time, um, at time which is relative to the event time. And this is done separately for men and women. Um, and so our controls in uh, the controls in the standard Clevens model is they introduce a control for the event time I. So the event time, uh, basically the baseline time is the time just before the event. So one year just before marriage or one year before childbirth, that is your reference point. And then you have um, zero would be your childbirth or marriage, t equal to zero is your childbirth or marriage. And then you would have this for every year subsequent to childbirth or marriage. We also introduce age as well as calendar year dummies to control for certain age specific um, effects and as well as any effects that might have been peculiar to a particular ca calendar year. So this was a simple model that Clevens as well as Berniel used to look at the impact of these events and that we use the event study framework. Now, we, uh, our initial model uses a simple linear probability model. So for us, our outcome is the employment uh, variable, not earnings because we don't have that information. Um, so we look at different kinds of outcome, like I said. So we have overall work. So this is whether they participated in paid work or unpaid work. And by unpaid work, I must clarify that this is not caregiving work. This is not the work of social reproduction, but rather this is the work which contributes to the family's enterprise, farming enterprise, or when it contributes to the farm, uh, family's non-farm enterprise. So it could be helping out in the farm, it could be helping out in the shop. 
And it's known as the, and that's what we mean when we talk about unpaid or contributing family worker here. So we use the event study framework to model both the effect on overall work, the effect on paid work. So paid work would exclude your contributing family worker. Then we also separate between informal and formal work. Now, informal work here is self-employment and casual wage work and formal work um, to the, so it may, it is salaried, regular salaried work. And of course, I understand that most of salaried work may not be formal in that sense. So this is a very broad understanding of uh, formal work. So we are then able to see how each of these kinds of work varied or participation in this work varied post an event. Um, so that's our basic model, which has the event dummy, age dummy, and year dummies. We also have additional controls. So we do a further robustness check where we have additional controls. We, we have PSU fixed effects. We control for the household structure. By household structure, we are looking at whether, so we, and in our LFC, we also collected information on in every year, what did the household look like in terms of were you living with your, with your parents? Were you living with your in-laws? Did you have other family members living with you? So we control for the presence of other family members. We control for the education level, um, the year of marriage and the number of children and so on. Okay, so I'll get to the initial, just a basic summary um, descriptive of what our sample looked like. So to begin with note that it is a primarily rural sample. We have um, about 30 to 40% of our sample being around SCs and SDs. And men, uh, about 27% not literate and about 12% have higher secondary education. Women in general are less educated. So about 40% were not literate. And then we have very few who have um, above higher secondary education. So about 12% had um, higher secondary and above. Uh, and in, again, in, for, for, the, for, the, for our events of interest, Marriage and childbirth, and not surprisingly in the Indian context, are nearly universal events for our sample. So about 75% of the men that we spoke to were married and 89% of women were married. And um, of these married individuals, 87% had uh, children and about 90% of women had children. We did not, not surprisingly, have any instances where somebody was having a child without being married. Right? That never happened in our sample. So marriage is, is nearly universal and childbirth is always conditional on marriage and most of, most of our sample do have, uh, do record the presence of child. Okay, so now just initial, so on an average, men were about 35 years old, women were about 33 years old. And if you look at what is, if you look at the age at entry, so typically men entered the workforce around when they were 18 years old. They were in paid work around 19. So they probably worked in the family farm or business around 18. By 19, they had got, they were starting paid employment. And around 22 years old, they were married. Two years later, two to three years later was when they recorded their first child. For women, on the other hand, as you see a slight difference. So the first event really for women is marriage. So at 18 years old, women are married on an average. Um, and the age of entry is around 19 to 20. And around the same time is also when they have their first child. Uh, so although the gap between the um, marriage and childbirth is very similar for men and women, they typically have a two year gap. It is the ordering of the events is very different. So for men, it's work, marriage, child. For women, it's marriage and then maybe work and then um, child. So note that all of this average age is for those women who do participate. It's conditional on participating in the workforce. Okay. So now coming to the broad um, event study results. Right. So what is this? Uh, I'll just spend some time on trying on explaining how to interpret the graph. So the red line here is our event time. In this case, it's marriage and. Uh, we, can't, we don't really have a fixed month of marriage. We don't ask that information. So this is between zero and minus one. So any time between this is the event time. And um, every point uh, is basically the change in the participation in labor market participation, in this case, overall employment. 
um, vis-a-vis the baseline time, which is uh, the year just before marriage. Right? And so what this means, so the gray line is for men and the dark black, um, the black line is for women. So what this means is that as you see for men, there's really no change um, before marriage, after marriage, it's completely unchanged vis-a-vis -vis the pre-marriage employment rate. But for women, after marriage, you see a, almost a 50% jump in uh, participation vis-a-vis -vis their baseline. And this is a steady increase in subsequent years. Okay? And so what this says is that Relative to marriage, women experience um, prior to marriage, compared to the year prior to marriage, there is a significant and positive uh, change in women's labor market participation. Okay. Now, we then look at what is the kind of employment that's changing. So the first kind of disaggregation that we do is to disaggregate between your contributing family worker. So you're, are you helping in the family farm or in the business? Um, and the second kind of disaggregation is um, dis distinguishing between paid employment, right? So this, this could include self-employment, casual wage work, um, or salaried work. These are the three kinds of paid employment. And so here what we see is that there's a nearly 60% increase in contributing family worker in the year immediately after marriage, but then it steadies down. It's a one-time increase and then it sort of stabilizes. In the case of paid employment, so the earlier employment, uh, overall employment movement we see is largely led by an increase in paid employment. Okay? So what is the paid employment that is increasing? And also just to just also do note that the confidence intervals here are vis-a-vis -vis the baseline event. Right? So it's significantly different from the baseline event. Um, now, what is the paid event that is seeing an increase? So Informal work here refers to salary, uh, self-employment and casual employment, and formal work here is salaried employment. So salaried employment sees no change. There's no significant change in salaried or formal work for women. What we see an increase in is informal work. And what is that informal work? It's either self-employment or casual work. Self-employment sees a sort of one-time significant increase um, for women, but what we see a steady increase and this whole uh, increase in subsequent years is really led by an increase in women's participation in informal work post marriage. So what this then is saying is that unlike what we, what we would expect that marriage maybe is keeping women out of the labor market, what we are finding is that post marriage there is some huge jump in women's labor market participation. And this participation is largely led by an increase in the informal work, particularly in casual wage work. There is also an increase in self-employment and contributing family work, but most of this is seen in the initial uh, year after marriage, but it's, it's not a steady increase. We also did some further heterogeneity um, on these results to see what is the nature of work again. We see that this is largely led by an increase in agricultural work. So non-agricultural work does not seem to have such a huge jump in employment rates post-marriage. The increase is seen for both educated women and less educated women, but it's much higher in the case of less educated women. Uh, and this also, um, it, it resonates with the general understanding of the Indian labor market, which is that it is less educated women that are primarily participating. And further, it is also driven by women from poorer households. Here too, the increase is seen amongst women in the richer households as well, but it's a much, much smaller increase that we see for those women. The relative increase is much higher for uh, women from poorer households. So post-marriage broadly, what we have is an increase in paid employment, uh, particularly in casual wage work, driven largely by agricultural work amongst, um, and also seen far more amongst less educated women and those from poorer households. Okay, so now coming to childbirth, right? So now a similar, we adopt a similar uh, approach where we have now our event of interest is childbirth. And a quick glance now suggests that yes, post childbirth, there is a, in the year immediately uh, after childbirth, there is no significant increase, but uh, in subsequent years, there is an increase. But then 
if you look at this, there is what we have is what is understood in the event study literature as pre-trends, which is that even before the birth of the first child, women's labor market participation is already increasing. Um, and so then, you know, is it, it's not sort of um, restricted to just the, an increase seen only after childbirth. It was already increasing prior to childbirth as well. Um, and so this, if you juxtapose this with our initial findings, which is to say that there is an increase after marriage, what this means is that post marriage, there is yes, an increase. Okay. And then this increase is, if, if it had continued in the same trend, it would have been much higher. Childbirth mutes that increase to some, some extent, there is some um, muted effect, but in the year, uh, in say year one or two years after childbirth, there is a steady and significant increase um, in women's labor market participation, right? So here too, this is again consistent with our earlier results of that this is largely informal work and this is casual wage work as well, which is then, uh, which is really driving these increase in women's labor market participation. Um, yeah, so this, there's really no increase in contributing family workers. So earlier we had seen a huge jump in women's participation in contributing family work. That we don't see here uh, in the case after childbirth. And rather it's just in, an, in paid employment. And most of this is really in um, casual wage work. Right? And so this is similar to what we had seen in the context of marriage, which extends after childbirth as well. So now we're trying to we were trying we we're trying to think through mechanisms of why these are happening. Why is it that these life events have no negative impacts as what one would expect? So one I understanding, I mean, one thing that we need to understand is that the pre-marriage LFPR amongst women is already very low. So for most women, one, you have to start with the uh, knowledge that age uh, of marriage is quite low, it's at 18. Um, so prior to marriage, there's very few years in which they can genuinely participate in the labor market. And so pre-marriage LFPR is already low. So it's already so low, so the trend can only move up. So it is bound to increase in a sense, right? But it was also likely, um, we on, on our data alone, it's difficult to, to sort of um, unpack this mechanism, but it is also likely that there is a change in norms post-marriage, that um, notions of chastity and purity that are attached to women are loosened after marriage, particularly for uh, women from poorer households, which brings me to the next point where for many uh, households, employment is a necessity and not a choice. And, you know, there is a, certainly a luxury to not participate in the labor market. So for when, many women, um, post-marriage, there is a loosening of norms, which then allows them to participate in the uh, labor market. They don't even have a choice to not work. And informal work, because of the fact that of because of its ease of entry and exit and very low entry barriers, it allows women to engage in market work alongside all of their other responsibilities. And so in that sense, they are faced with smaller penalties. So a penalty in terms of participation does not exist because of this buffer of informal work, uh, the, the buffer that the informal economy offers to these, um, to these women. And so there is um, a larger literature which says that, which finds that informal workers are more likely to return to work after childbirth. There's evidence of early weaning among mothers in informal work. So issue, things like childbirth are not really constraints that hold them back. There is the necessity of employment that forces them to engage and informal work then gives them this option to navigate the labor market uh, in the face of these other constraints. So, the limitations, and I mean, there's, this is just few of the, them. There's, I'm sure there are more. Um, one is there is uh, there's a possibility of recall bias because this is retrospective data. So we are potentially going to a 40 year old woman and recalling her participation from when she was 15 years old. So there is a possibility of recall bias. We have information only on the extensive margin, uh, but not on the intensive margin. So we don't have information on earnings and hours work. So it is possible that you know, there, is, there is no penalty in terms of participation and the extensive margin, but it is possible that they take a hit in terms of how much earnings they have, how secure is this employment, what are the sort of other benefits they have with work as, long as, as well as the hours worked. 
Um, and there is a more econometric concern that there is, in the case of childbirth, there are pre-trends that uh, exist, uh, exist, so we can't conclusive, conclu conclusively say um, about the causal effect of childbirth on uh, women's labor market participation. So um, we broadly study the impact of marriage and childbirth, um, and we find that in the context of early age of marriage and childbirth, there is a very different mechanism at work. There are norms that, that are potentially loosened after marriage, perhaps um, the necessity of work and poverty of households in, and the existence of informal labor markets then uh, imply that women are often forced to work. And so this then also give, helps us to sort of question the notion of a child penalty because implicit in the idea of a penalty is that withdrawing from work is bad. And so it's, it's seen as a bad thing that women have to withdraw from work. But really in a developing country context where women are forced to engage in work and that too in potentially very precarious work, um, it may not be necessarily a good thing. So the absence of a penalty in terms of employment participation, we suggest is not in itself indicative of a favorable outcome. Um, and so this really also throws the idea of questioning the notion of work, women's work, um, and the nature of their participation in the labor market in a developing country context, where most of this work may not always be one of voluntary participation, and it's rather it's a forced participation. So the idea of a penalty may not exist, and that not in, a, in India, but in, or at least in the context of this study, but that's not really a favorable outcome as such. Okay, thank you. Um, Thank you so much, Rosa. I think it was a very interesting presentation. Uh, for me, I am first time coming, becoming acquainted with something like a retrospective recall data for a life history event. So that's something really new. Um, so we are open up for questions. Um, we have quite a few participants here. And if anybody has any question, they can unmute themselves, raise their hands, and go ahead and shoot a question. So just to warm up, maybe I'll go ahead and ask a stupid question because I do not know much about the labor force, but okay. So what's surprising to me is like when you compare the developed country like Austria, Germany, uh, you know, in, 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 in juxtaposing it to the rural India, there's like this stark difference that women, when they have childbirth, they, they have all these, uh, I can say institutes in place to assist them in such developed countries and they still do not wish to use that. And then you have a two year period where they are not in the workforce and then they come back and they are at a lower wage, uh, right? But in, in India, you see that, that probably they are in a much more formal environment where that two years lack period does impact their working quality or whatever, they've missed out on some changes and so on. But for India, when you, and it's unfortunate that we do not have the urban side, which could sort of like look at and, and bring that thing to the fore. But with rural India, what we look is that there is this force and we do not know how to compare with respect to wages and earnings. So there's a data limitation with this study that even if they do join, maybe they come back with like the same earnings because the kind of the job that they have that they did prior to the childbirth and they will get back to uh, the work after the childbirth would be the same. So would you think that the earnings would maybe like be the same, whether they are prior to the childbirth or after the childbirth, the earnings wouldn't change from like the, the anecdotal advice or from the, the respondents in the survey, because that is something which is very striking when you look at the difference. People do enter and they're at a lower wage rate, but here because they are in such a precarious situation, they're already at a low base. So I don't think there should be much difference when they enter back. Yeah, should I go ahead and answer, Anisha, are we taking more questions? Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. So I, unfortunately, we don't have the data, but I will actually use um, Gotham's, Leela Gotham's paper, which I've referenced there. Now hers is not a panel study. So in that sense, it's not tracking women over time, but she's kind of pulled the official employment data from uh, the NSS. So she has, I think about 20 years of, um, 20, spanning 20 years, but maybe six different data sets. So it's six separate samples which are pulled together. But what she finds is exactly what you said that um, the wage penalty for urban India is significant and it is positive. I think there's about an 18% drop in wage wages for women when they come back or it, not, again, from her study, you can't say when they come back, 
but for women uh, in the presence of younger children in the household there is a wage penalty but for urban uh, for rural india she doesn't find a hugely significant wage penalty that women have and this like you said comes from the a the it comes from the nature of the informal market that rural women are participating in it is already at very low um wages and it's really sort of pegged at the bare minimum so there's really not much of a hit that they can take in terms of uh, casual wage work the it's probably daily wage rates that they have which are negotiated on a daily basis and there's mo- not much scope for a penalty in the earnings as such so in that sense you may not see an earnings uh, um penalty in rural india and it's really manifested <clears throat> really in the in in um in in the fact that it is that they have to continue working so the penalty in my understanding is that like one of the studies point that there is this incidence of higher weaning early early, early weaning of children right so there is an inability to spend time with children or to to engage, to sort of extended breastfeeding and things like that so those are the kinds of penalty that women have to incur um, around childbirth but it's not really an employment penalty as such i think i've got enough to warm up for these people around here in the participation circle i think arun you're forced to go ahead and ask a question now. i i think uh, emmanuel has already raised his hand so i will go after that all right go ahead in the while emmanuel prepares his question again i actually uh, have a clarificatory question so what is your definition of enmo- uh, employment so is it like you ask them where you employed this one because the, the you know the the earlier web- webinar series that we had we discussed a lot about this measurement issue which you also touched upon in your literature about uh, ashini desh pandey's paper etc so uh, was your definition different from the normal nsso uh, uh, you know questions of employment and we uh, a, a clarificatory question continues and and is nreg a part of formal work or uh, or or the informal work what what did you define it as yeah okay um so in the lhc we specific we um, basically uh, the, we had um, asked about casual wage work self employment and both of these agricultural and non agricultural so we did ask about the different types of work what did you prime but then um, like in the nss we use a primary status so for the majority of the year what was your primary status was the question that was asked um and so because of that again we don't have marginal work activities so if a woman was primarily maybe for more than 6 months she was out of the labor market then as per our method she would be in um, sort of recorded as not working and so this is really the usual activity status as it's understood in the nss so again so on the marginal again on the margin there is possibility that there might be um, um an improvement in employment but then that would mean that this was again what we are getting is probably lower bounds of um, the increase in employment rate it might just be higher uh, if you are able to better capture the more marginal activities um, and on the question of the nreg so we broadly this is again uh, in our survey training our enumerators were trained to capture narega as casual wage work so that would have featured as a casual wage work and not as formal or salaried employment Thanks, Arun. Uh, next, we have Zenzi Pahala. If I'm pronouncing the name right, go ahead and mute yourself. We can't hear you, Zenzi. Hello, can you hear me yeah. now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> Okay, sorry. I'm like I'm in my uh, university library at the moment, so I'm gonna, I'm trying to like speak slowly. For the, I mean, speak a little bit low. But first, I just want to say thank you very much for this um, presentation and the paper. It was very eye-opening. Um, I'm actually uh, studying at the University of Cape Town in South Africa, and we have a very different situation in South Africa in terms of um, the labour market, uh, women's uh, participation, as well as marriage and childbirth. So, uh, firstly, one of the very interesting things that I found from your study was that uh, marriage is attached uh, to, or yeah, like uh, the uh, childbirth and marriage seem to. 
uh, go together. But here in South Africa, that's not always the case. A lot of the time, you'll have a lot more single mothers. So I think it just highlights the importance of understanding the the context and the country with which you're studying, and to remember that you like there shouldn't always be blanket policies. So it was just the first really uh, I really like that. Um, about your presentation. Then I just have a question. I do know that you uh, didn't look at uh, the int intensive margin, specifically hours worked. Um, but I just want to find out what do you think would happen to hours worked? Because on the one hand, you mentioned that there's like sort of early weaning that seems to take place, but also the type of work that women seem to be going into is informal and casual work, which also somewhat allows them to be able to do more childcare. Uh, or, you know, to um, allow for more uh, childcare time as well. So in this instance, what do you think would um, happens in terms of hours worked and uh, the well-being, the overall well-being of these women? Like, is it actually improving their well-being or do you think that maybe they are spending actually more time working and it's maybe decreasing their well-being? But that's what I wanted to ask. Thank you so much. Thank you, Zenzi. And I think it's a really interesting question and it's something that we've been grappling with uh, trying to understand what it so and i think your question brings me to this notion of flexibility in a developing country context right so there's one way to say that informal work, informal labor markets offer the flexibility of uh, coming in and going but really um, does it i mean you question then it's probably easy to enter it's probably easy to go to someone's farm and get that employment or go to a contractor who will seek will find very casual work for you um, but often most of this work is not really negotiable in terms of the time that you spend on it or even in terms of the earnings that you can make on it so in that sense um, i think we have to really um, uh, qualify the understanding of flexibility. It's flexible uh, to the extent that you can enter, but once you're in, you're probably in it for the long haul, in the sense, at least in that day, you're going to be fully engaged in it. And also this comes from sort of, you know, anecdotal evidence. So I remember this um, this journalist piece, Ainat, who's been working intensively in rural areas, and he describes this working day of women, you know, so she says that they wake up at four in the morning, um, do whatever household chores need to be done, leave at five, walk a few kilometers to the near nearest railway station, which takes them to their nearest um, employment market on Monday, where they then get their job. And then they are back home at nine. And these are mothers of young children. Um, and so there's this, of course, they're easily able to enter and exit, but then there's a huge I would not say that there is, unlike in the developed country context where they, you have these ideas of part-time work and you don't need to come in every day or you don't need to spend your know, full eight hours at work. I don't think, um, again, no data to qualify this, but I think based on just anecdotal evidence and the kind of work that's available in India, I don't think women have the luxury of bargaining on other aspects on the intensive margin. So then I would say that it is probably not a welfare improving participation in informal work. It's probably, you know, a sort of forced participation because they need incomes and they need to support their households. All right. Um, Suresh, uh, I see your hand raised. Why don't you go ahead and ask your question? Uh, yes. Uh, actually, my it's not a question type. I think it's like a time confusing. See, for example, you have seen different life events uh, in case of females. So you have seen for every event, there is an increase in. Uh, there is an increase in. But if you consider uh, unpaid work, like you consider some unpaid work, but if you consider the unpaid care work, so if you consider the unpaid care work, so the it is shifting uh, more than the double or double or maybe the curve will be uh, the curve will shift uh, i think upward so my concern is like so uh, like uh, in case of care work uh, when it comes to the female so we are like you are like once the, they enter into the marriage so the the work as actually starting for them but even uh, after the first birth, like giving the first birth, uh, mostly I think you can see the two outcomes there. For example, uh, maybe educated uh, urban elites 
so there they will be having some rest for some days maybe uh, some uh, some years like even the government is trying for three years uh, child care leave like that so that will be one one point and another point like maybe uh, even though if you having a child birth or not uh, there may be uh, that the curve may be rising for even other people like uh, our rural people uh, rural uh, daily wage workers so like how you see these two scenarios like one is with respect to the care work uh, and another one is with this uh, this thing um okay so, so just to clarify suresh um when we talk about the unpaid work when and the results that i have shown this does not inc include care work this is what is called unpaid work in the context of the family farm or the family business so suppose you have women who work in the family farm but they don't actually get wages for it they are not directly reimbursed for that work that would qualify as unpaid work suppose she uh, takes care of the family shop or uh, runs the small scale enterprise for a while she doesn't get an income she doesn't get a wage or salary in hand but she contributes to an activity that brings in household income and that is the notion of unpaid work here or contributing family worker so the work that woman does in terms of care work and engaging with her children or household responsible household uh, work is not captured here at all and we did not collect that so that a woman who primarily did that would be classified as out of the labor force but we have no understanding of whether that time spent in that has increased or not that that is not collected so when you talk about the increase that you saw in unpaid family work that is an increase in the unpaid family work in the family farm or business so it's the women who post marriage are now helping in the family farm helping in whatever business work business that the family does she is not paid for it and this is not care work that sees a one time increase and it's interesting that what this increase actually what we see is if you look at between um, poorer and richer women richer women are driving the contributing family worker increase uh, so that means the richer women are actually working inside maybe per perhaps the confines of the home but she is contributing to the household's income it poorer women are now going out and working post marriage casual wage work largely it's happening for both but most of uh, there's a relative difference between the two so just to clarify that the increase that you see is not really in care work it's it's the increase in in uh, helping out in the farm or business and that and that is different from care responsibilities i hope that clarifies okay, thanks rosa i think so yes, if you have follow up you. questions he can just type them out so next is uh, uh, shrinivas and then you can have dipangita so shrinivas first you go ahead and then dipangita hi uh, um sorry i joined late a little bit i could not isn't to the sampling design and the sample size of the okay. survey on basically about the survey uh, but with the discussion i'm guessing that it is a small scale survey conducted by uh, your team right as a so we have about um, 6000 individuals 5951 individuals to be specific and it was done in karnataka it was done in karnataka and rajasthan it was intended to be representative at the state level but because of the pandemic we had to cut it short so it, in that sense we weren't we did have a um, you know a stratified sampling setup but we couldn't complete it so in that sense our data as it stands is not representative of either state yeah because why i'm asking because you know the like the results are really uh, like contradicting to the whatever we have seen across the other surveys and even one one paper i think chavi is attending i think she she worked with me on, on one paper which is in r and r in one of the journal population studies uh, so uh, actually we, we used ihds uh, we mm -hmm. used ihds and we used it, uh, because ihds is a longitudinal survey so we could trace that you know how the the child birth like for changing the fertility levels from uh, isds 1 to 2 how it, it, it affected 
uh, the labor market outcome, both in intensive as well as uh, even in intensive margins. So uh, it, there we could find a clear evidence of like, you know, there is a motherhood penalty, uh, mm -hmm. uh, both for the uh, employment participation and then as well as the wages and number of hours they are working. Uh, mm -hmm. And also, I, I know I, uh, recently the Ashwini Deshpande put one more a working paper in IGA. So that is also showing the same uh, kind of, and she used it, I think, the periodic labors. Uh, no, no, I think it's the CMI data. CMI data. So uh, same I also is a longitudinal survey, so one can stress uh, like, because she's given uh, space with three like entry, exit, and re-entry also. So by looking at all these things and just a, a few clarifications, one is uh, have you taken the natal family uh, context? So for the women, because you know the women migrates after marriage. Uh, and she comes to uh, uh, mostly the in-laws place. Have you uh, collected information on not a family composition, like whether they have a brothers, how, or what is the family type, and also uh, or the economic status of the family, like you know, like when they might come, because that has a, a very significant impact. And we have we have seen the studies, like you know, how the mother-in-law presence or mother's presence have how they, they makes a big difference when even if the child is there, if somebody has to take care of children at the home, then she can have a higher chance of getting into a labor market. So that kind of context uh, information whether you collected that and whether you controlled for that. And also, the, when you're comparing with men, are the men are the husbands or the, it's like a couple comparison or it, the men is different from uh, uh, like a husband, like it's a different independent family uh, people. That is also very important because when the husband is working, husband earnings, because we know that, you know, because uh, like, you know, uh, uh, this income effect model so where you know, if husband is earning, then the, the women's mostly uh, higher chance of staying back at home and taking care of their family work or family and care work or care work. So that is also one important thing, like, you know. And another thing is, see, when we are tracing these events, you know, the if women is going in a life course, they're moving from in a not a prime working age group to a prime working age group. So certainly there will be an increase because we nobody expect them to work at 14 or 15 or 16 because uh, uh, mostly even if you look at the Young Life Survey uh, where we have recently uh, did one more piece there, you know, uh, in Young Life Survey, we've seen that the children up to 14, 15, actually women are more burdened with unpaid work care work and we have and male or male children are more engaged in school uh, uh, and play play uh, uh, time for the play uh, playing and other activities entertainment activities so so if if they were they're moving in the uh, age uh, ladder so they're moving to the working age group right so they they more attend to work so what i think that in the uh, in the model what we see, it's good to have it, you know, relative uh, uh, difference for male and, uh, male and female as an outcome variable. Like even one can go for difference in difference, like, you know, in the beginning of, uh, the uh, before the event, what is the male female difference in terms of relative difference in terms of work for participation and how it is in the end or uh, post birth, you know, I think that could be give, uh, that could have given, you know, whether really women that there is no gender discrimination even after childbirth, rather than actually because it's the absolute. If you go in the absolute ladder, then because see the with the working age uh, improving, so they they more tended to come to the labor force, okay. And also after childbirth, there is a distress employment also because they need family needs more income to support the uh, the uh, ch uh, children's education, care, and everything. So they might come into, uh, that's a kind of a distress employment also. So therefore, what I see, if you need to see that there is a gender discrimination or not, then it's a relative 
uh, ratio, like you know, uh, between male and female, that I think should be the outcome. And also, there is the other survival. Because the demographer, I think, age, age I, report. You know, I, I think we didn't get the last part. I don't know if it was just me, but I didn't hear what you just said in the last bit. Didn't hear either, but I think he was suggesting about the age part, the survival. To the no, 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 no. That's, uh, I think I thought of imputing, uh, uh, using a survival model, uh, taking uh, uh, age as a time variable, but I don't think that that is, I think, any useful for the kind of question she is thinking of. Uh, but as a demographer, always, you know, the retrospective surveys you go back to 40, 30 years, then the age reporting is really, really a big, big, big issue, particularly Rajasthan, which is taken. Uh, I think whether we need, uh, like, how accurately women are reporting age, especially women reporting their age. So, because in the, the first table where the, you presented the means, uh, age at first birth, age at first marriage, and age, that that actually can really affect uh, in terms of uh, whether it, if it is is that retrospective reporting. Okay, thank you. I hope I can do justice to these questions. Um, I also just want to um, say that my co-author Rahul is also here. So Rahul, if you want to step in on any of them, please feel free. But okay, let me take the first one, which is the natal family context. Yeah. Uh, so we did have information on the household structure at every point of time. So when the woman was say from when she was 15 years old, who was she living with? Was she living with her parents and other people? Now, if we don't have really, if she has who, who were those siblings, were there brothers, were there sisters? Was it, we just have parents, uh, in-laws and uh, other family members or extended family. So we have that and um, in our sort of robustness checks, so I have not included those model results. We do include the household structure at every point of time as a control. Um, both for the both the, both the um, natal family, if the woman was living with the natal family or the husband's family. So whatever was the household structure of that household that she was currently living in, both you know, before or after childbirth. So that is in, in, uh, included. And we don't see a huge difference even after accounting um, for the presence or the absence of um, other family members. Um, and in the, the, sec, the question on other men, husbands, no. So this in this sample, it's basically how the um, respondent selection took place was that we randomly selected one adult male and one adult female. So they may or may not be husbands. So in that sense, these are, um, they're not spousal pairs. And so in, uh, there's not a perfect comparison of um, between men and women. Uh, they may or may not be married to each other. We also do include the uh, in the LHC for every point of time, we did ask the spouse's employment. So we did ask about what was a house, husband's primary employment status at every point of time subsequent to marriage. Um, and we do um, have, well, actually we haven't had that as a control and we can introduce that and see if that really changes things substantially. Um, yeah, so... I mean, so on, on the, uh, I think your point on the young lives and this idea on, and the unpaid work that um, what, I think what we're trying to say is that, well, unpaid work and household care work are constraints to women's participation, but they may not be binding constraints as they are understood. So, um, and I think in a sense that it, it also then, so Ashwini's study with CMI or, doesn't suggest exactly the same thing, but she also finds that childbirth on its own doesn't seem to have a significant effect on women's participation. They continue to move in and out of the labor market and childbirth as an event doesn't really affect this transitions of out of in and out of the work, labor market. They may withdraw in anticipation, but subsequent to that, there is an increase. Um, and so I, and I see that our results are not um, really speaking to some of the uh, other studies, but I do also want to say that our, as is a longer time period that we followed. So if we have a 40 year old period, a 40 year old individual, we've actually tracked them for every year from when they were 15 years old. Um, so in that sense, the dynamics is far more apparent in this approach than a, a two period panel, say, for instance. 
Um, yeah, I think that's a great suggestion on the male female counterfactual. I think Rahul is better placed to answer this on whether we've compared um, the difference. What I can say is that so pre childbirth, women's labor market participation, um, sorry, pre marriage was 26%. And then this jumps uh, on an average. So this jumps to 54% five years after childbirth. So there's a clear almost doubling of LFPR. And then for men, between these for these same points of time, there's no change. So that itself suggests that there is a sort of contraction in the gender gap between these two time periods. And I think it's not unreasonable to say that that gender gap is probably uh, systematically and steadily contracting over the years subsequent to that, to child, to marriage. But we we can definitely um, sort of use that as a as an outcome rather than just participation of women alone, because then, then you can get the counterfactual like you suggested. Yeah, and point taken on the accuracy of reporting age. And this really was um, something we really struggled with in the field and trying to sort of pin down what the current age itself and then working back from there. Yeah, there is definitely possibilities of error there and happy to, and I can, I will look at survival models. I'm not familiar with if this. I can, if I can add one more point, can I, can I? Sure, sure. Can I? I'm asking the chair. Okay. Ah, okay. This is one thing is like one is results separate for uh, Rajasthan and Karnataka. Could, they like added another story because if you look at mm -hmm. like culturally, two yeah. are very different uh, states yeah, yeah. and if, uh, and for Karnataka, I can think like, you know, if you look at the Meena Savala's uh, mm -hmm. uh, literature or like her work, uh, if for in, case, in case of Andhra, Andhra Pradesh, she's, she suggests that, you know, after childbirth, even after, mainly after sterilization, okay, because the, the, uh, um, the period from marriage to uh, completion of fertility is not very big in both Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh. You know, mm -hmm. They quickly, they, after marriage, they quickly have children and no. then get sterilized. Okay. Mm -hmm. After sterilization, actually, there is an increase in women's status. Mm -hmm. Because they get, I think, they said an anthropological, she has explored it through an anthropological literature and uh, uh, it's an ethnographic study. So that's what I can understand. Like there is a slight improvement in the women autonomy and the way we look at uh, the, the protect, protection around the girls and girl children, that will go up. And then they have get some kind of freedom to enter into the labor market. And all. But in case of Rajasthan, it will completely opposite, actually. Yeah. But they be, that, be, that also needs to be looked into. So if we can add these two different models for the yeah, so we don't, we don't see a huge... Rosa, uh, can I answer? Yeah, sure. Um, so we have looked at Karnataka and Rajasthan separately, um, and uh, they don't seem to be very significantly different. They are similar, the trends are similar in terms of labor force participation uh, increasing in both after marriage as well as after childbirth. Uh, just quickly to some of your other points about uh, age not being accurate, uh, that is completely taken. Um, but uh, I don't think that has an impact on the results because... Uh, being an event study, you're trying to look at what happens pre-marriage to post-marriage. Uh, and also, um, with age, labor force participation should increase, um, as you said, but then age is controlled for in terms of uh, uh, there are age fixed effects. Secondly, the change is, um, so with age, there should be a gradual change, whereas you, uh, what we find is a sudden jump upon marriage of labor force participation, as well as for childbirth, more for marriage than childbirth, indicating that the event itself matters, not just the transition, because you're just moving in eight band, you're moving from one year as, in, as you uh, progress, but uh, the event itself matters. So there's a big jump and then there is, and then there are uh, certain changes. So that jump itself is sort of um, indicating that it is due to the event and not just due to aging or uh, as you progress uh, in the this and just to come back to the points of uh, the results might feel surprising but if you think of the context uh, of a rural informal economy where uh, women uh, get married early um, so even in the Chilean paper what they find is that uh, informal work uh, sort of uh, the decline is mostly in formal work not in informal work rural India is almost all 92 to 94 percent informal 
Um, and so the results make sense in that context where work is mostly informal and certainly in the case of uh, India, both uh, gender norms are very strict uh, before marriage in terms of uh, mobility and also whether women can uh, work and the protection of women um, or girls who are unmarried. Uh, whereas uh, after marriage, there might be some differences in the, uh, the norms and the responsibilities which women have. Um, so in that context, the results might make more sense. Yeah, there is another survey like uh, uh, Udaya. Uh, yeah, okay, survey, I think... I, I'll just mention that there's an informal section that will be happening, which will be off record. Maybe you can have this more discussion because I have to give Dipanvita and Jilam a chance to speak. Yeah. Okay, okay. All right. Thank you. Dipanvita, you can unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. So, uh, Rosa, I just had uh, one question. I completely understand the context in which uh, there is an increase in labor force participation among women after marriage. My question is, why do you think that there is a sustained increase? Like, I get the jump, you know, immediately after marriage because they might be participating in, you know, on the family farm. But there's a sustained increase, right? And it's a little muted following childbirth, which again makes sense, but there is an increase. So why do you think that is happening? Has there been any mediation channels investigated in this regard? I mean, so, I, I mean, I'd like to throw the question back to you on why you think it should only be a one-time increase. And that, you know, so in the first year after childbirth, X percent of women participate. And then two years after you have more women participating and three years after you have more women participating. And that seems reasonable, right? So as um, of course there is the sort of um, childcare burdens easing over time as child children grow older and that allows participation for more women, uh, which is not to say that childbirth then is a huge event, but it is to say that it's not a binding constraint, right? So I would say that to me, it's not entirely surprising that it is increasing. It's also that as so post-marriage, there is the event of childbirth, which then also means that there is a need to supplement household incomes potentially. Um, and so that is also potentially one of the mechanisms that then sustain that increase and even push it up even further. So I think that could be one possible mechanisms. The other interesting thing, and I mean, if there's not, I don't know if we can read a lot into it. We also tried to look at um, the gender of the child that was born. Does that really, does that really influence the nature of the increase? And you know, for whether it's a male child or a female child, which is the first child, um, there is an increase. But what we are seeing is that when it's a male child, when women are more likely, the increase is seen more in paid work rather than contributing family work. So when it's a male child, there is probably greater need for investment in the child. And in that sense, women are then um, forced to go in and engage. Um, if It would have been interesting to see if as the girl child age, so if, if you have a first child as women, is, there, is a girl and then you know, if the second child is a, is a boy, does that really change things? We don't have enough data to look at that. Um, but I think it's it's sort of the mandates of requiring income support at um, in the households that then sustains that increase over time. Okay, so that is in the context of childbirth. So if you see that marriage and childbirth events are really close together. So marriage propels an increase, then there's almost, I mean, there's a two-year gap, one year of pregnancy, and uh, that doesn't really change things. So what we are saying is that whatever you see as a push-up as a result of marriage continues and it's more or less unaffected by the childbirth event and that continues. So as you, as you are in your marriage longer, you are then mandated to man perhaps not mandated, but your um, likelihood of participating does increase. Um, older women have lesser norms attached to them as well. So that could also drive the increase. Yeah. That makes sense. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Jila, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, am I audible? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it, though I joined a bit late because of some prior work. Um, I just had a clarificatory question. So 
um, I, I think I missed this point. So um, may I know if the participation in the agricultural and non-agricultural labor force varies significantly for females? I mean, were this categorized as separate category? Like, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so it does. So most of the increase, the, the, the huge increase that you see is in agricultural work. We don't see a significant increase in non-agricultural work. But I do. I would say that because our sample is primarily rural, it is also likely that many women or many opportunities in non-agricultural work. So agricultural work is traditionally the most important employment. So I would be cautious to read too much into it. But I would say that the thing is that it's informal work that's driving it. In the rural context that we have, this informal work is primarily agricultural. Right. Um. Like whether. Like since in the census, uh, like the census data, uh, we mm -hmm. often come across like the agricultural laborers and then there's this cultivators. So mm -hmm. um, whether like the agricultural laborers generally tend to be the landless workers. So yeah. whether the land ownership of the households, does it yeah. matter for their participation in the agricultural uh, uh, workforce or not? I was wondering. Yeah. The land no, ownership yeah, no, I, so this is a really important question. And so one thing that we see is that if it was cultivators, then it would have manifested as a jump in self-employment. Um, right. as, as that would be what cultivators is. But what we see is a, an increase in casual wage work. Now, we also did do a sort of heterogeneity test because we had asked in our survey the question of ownership of land. So we had asked if, does your household own land? And when we looked at that, we looked at um, the non-land owning households and the land owning households. Is there a difference in the increase in the kind of work? We don't see an increase. So the casual wage work increase is actually seen even amongst households that own land. So it was not really a cultivator kind of employment. It was women actually going out and making working in somebody else's fields, uh, so to say. So the ownership of land didn't really change the, the nature of work um, that they were participating in. Okay, okay. Uh, so just, just one more question. I mean, because I missed few points. So um, like, since as you said that uh, the land ownership didn't matter regarding their participation. So does like, uh, whether their influence of any socio-demographic profiles of the household, I mean, like the occupation of the husband or like the gender or uh, age of the household heads or the dependency ratio, like does that matter about their participation? Like was there an interaction between the land ownership with such um, um, factors? So, yeah, no, we haven't looked at how these interact. Um, we do control for the husband's um, employment as a control, but it's not, we've not sort of looked at the heterogeneity in terms of the current employment of the household. Does that change these results? Okay. Um, uh, yeah, so because we can't really, the household, the, that characteristic, which is the employment status, is recorded for every time, every point of time from when they were 15 years old, right? So there is no sort of, we can, if we want, sort of have, look at all of these years and, and ascribe a certain kind of identity to the household and then see if there's a difference in terms of what the husband does or what the head of the household does. But we haven't looked at that. And yeah, we could look at that and see if that really changes the, the nature of the chain, uh, the work that they women participate in. Yeah, uh, so like in many cases, uh, whenever like the woman uh, married yeah, at very- the time limit, so the- Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Thing. Definitely. Right. Thank you. Thank you for the time. Thanks. Thanks. Right. So uh, we will have to close the formal session that is the recording session here. And we will have a 10 minutes informal session just right after. But before, before we go there, I would like to thank uh, our speakers for the day, Rosa and also Rahul for joining in. Thank you so much for being part of uh, YSI South Asia's uh, Expanding Frontiers webinar series. Um, also, I would like to thank the lead organizer, Satvik De Biswas, and the Arun Balachandran, the co coordinator at the YSI. Uh, so do not go anywhere. We will just stop recording, and you can again bombard the speakers with your questions. Thank you for joining. Thank you so much, Anisha and Satvik and Arun, too, for the opportunity.